Hey everyone, today I'm going to be going through more of The Rite of Spring. This is episode number four. This piece is going to take me a really long time to get through. I'm currently on page 23 of a 160 page score, so you can work out for yourself and figure out how long this is going to take me. Maybe we can start making bets as to if I'm going to get through it on time or not. Anyways, let's jump right into the score and start pulling apart more of it. Alright, so here we are. I am uh, using the score from IMSLP, so the link is in the description. So if you also want to grab a score and follow along or add your own annotations, pull it apart yourself, go down into the description and grab the score. It's all public domain now, so you can grab it for free. Last time I left off with this section here, which was again starting to build up this chaotic texture. This texture seems much less chaotic than the in initial texture. The initial texture is very, very, very chaotic with even a lot of the elements themselves being quite disjunct, like the trombone line that was in the initial just the initial chaotic section, it was the principal line, felt very disjunct, didn't really feel like it was going anywhere, not a lot, not a lot of sense of melodic direction. In this case, a lot of our layers in this section have melodic direction. So like the top line is this flute part. That feels like it has some sense of melodic direction to it. It doesn't just feel like it's really chaotic. It's sort of circular because it's staying on very similar pitches, but Stravinsky has been using this technique in a lot of his melodies throughout this piece. Again, I think he's really trying to create that like pagan sound, which is what this piece is alluding to. We also have these clarinets going and then we have this main melody, which is in the trumpet, so. cool melody. It's really simple as well, all stepwise. So let's do some analysis of this next section. I uh, pulled apart a tiny bit of it saying that this texture, it's a similar thing, groupings of six in the contrabass and then other groupings in other instruments. So you get this sense that like, where is the bar line or is there a sense of polymeter, polyrhythmic polymeter? So let's, let's go through and pull this apart. I think that we have, well, first of all, let's identify this ostinato that's going throughout this whole thing. Dump, bump, beam, bump, 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 beam, bump. Very clearly here in the timpani and the trombones. I'm not gonna, I guess, no, antique symbol is doing something else. Antique symbol is following the top. Then we have, oh, interesting stuff actually in the first violin. Look at this material right here. We've got uh, this trill and then these quick notes. This looks like a Ludoswowski rhythm. And then, and then more of that. That's actually like a quite neat little gesture behind there. And this section continues. This section is eight bars long, which is a traditional phrase length. So he's kind of moved us from something that was very amorphous and free at the beginning towards something that is a little bit more traditional in construction. Here we have the flute and the grand flute are still doing the gesture up here, which I circled in blue. So I'll continue to circle that in blue. I'm gonna actually take this ostinato out from blue. So this continues straight through. Now we have oboes and oboes are also contributing to that gesture. All of these guys all together. Now, I wonder if these flutes playing these little um, arpeggiated figure, or sorry, grace note figures, I think that they're actually probably related to that figure as well. Like basically all the upper winds are kind of contributing to this, this textural sound, uh, minus the clarinets. The clarinets are doing their own thing. And I circled that, the clarinets here in, in, uh, in green. I'll do that again. So clarinets will be another element by the way, I think I should just pause and talk about my analytical technique here because I haven't talked about it so far. I've just really been uh, going through and just doing my thing and not really saying why I'm doing this. I'm specifically pulling it apart from a layering perspective right now because I think that that's the most salient feature about this section of the piece. It feels very much like the layers of the music that he stacks on top of each other to create these large sort of huge tutti sounds 
I find that that's the most interesting thing, sort of how these things work out contrapuntally, what's the pitch content of each one of these layers, how is that layer doubled, why is that layer, like why can you hear it clearly or why is it obscured in the texture? I think that's really the interest here. When we look at other things like um, maybe form, form is also interesting to some extent, but for me, I really wanted to pull out this idea of sort of how he's constructing these giant textures. For me, that's the most interesting thing. And then also small orchestrational uh, techniques. I'm sure as I move on to later sections in the piece that my analytical technique is gonna dramatically change. Maybe I'll specifically look at rhythmic, uh, rhythmic displacement and time set, use of time signatures, that kind of thing. But for now, I really think that layer, a layered approach is, is a good idea. He's establishing these little ostinati and then they keep going throughout sections and then he layers other things on top. So it's this kind of like pop production technique where you like build something that's good and then put something else on top and then something else on top and then something else on top, stacking things on top until you have something that is quite complex in sound. I think it's really fascinating and that's why I'm specifically analyzing the piece this way. Uh, this oboe gesture is hitting with the horns. Whew, this page is actually hard. So he does introduce this violin idea on the previous page. So I'll continue with that color there. He's really good at this. He'll introduce something and then that thing just takes off here. You can see that, right? It's like the first time he introduces it, he introduces it a couple times. First, it's just one line, then it's doubled in thirds, and then it appears and it has, it, it's really just become part of the background now, these flowing 16th note motion underneath everything. The ostinato I put in purple, so I'll continue marking it in purple. Oops, right here, these guys. No, not antique symbols, oh my gosh. I think that another reason this approach can be very helpful is that with today's technology and how we tend to write music, this copy and the, the, the draw of the copy and paste button can be very, very seductive within the within our music notation softwares. And because of that, it's nice to go back and look at what humans were doing before the advent of digital technology, and then ask the question, is the digital technology that I'm interfacing with right now creating a barrier for me to create the pinnacle of musical expression? So like, is the computer actually stopping you from creating great music? Now, I don't have the answer to that question. I think that a lot of older composers of the generation that is instructing my generation would say, yes, digital technology is clearly removing something. People are not able to create, um, in terms of, I'm talking orchestral music or uh, chamber music, people are getting caught up in the sort of distractions and the downsides of the digital technology. Whereas so other people who are maybe writing electroacoustic music or something is like, no, we couldn't, we couldn't make this expression without this technology. So you really have to answer that question for yourself. But for me, going through and pulling this apart from a layering perspective is actually another way of me identifying or at least contextualizing this question within my own life. Because then I can see how the sort of trends or the habits that digital technology pushes me towards how those trends, how I could use them in an effective way. Layering is really easy with digital technologies. So how could I use it in a way that's really interesting instead of trying to fight against it and just go, I'm not gonna layer anything, I'm never gonna use copy paste. But in this case, we're looking at Stravinsky and he's done a lot of this. Although what I am seeing as I look through the piece is that when he does layer things, he tends to not just copy and paste a lot. There are sections like that, like here in the, uh, in the clarinets, the clarinets are just repeating the same thing over and over and over again. And the flutes are falling into a similar kind of repetition, but it's not always a direct repetition. So that's another reason why I think that this approach to analytics is helpful for me specifically. So we have these shots that are now happening in the brass. I would like to go through at some point, I'll just put them in brown. 
these shots and they're here here as well. I would like to go through at some point and, and really look at those shots and ask the question if those are rhythmically related in some way to something else in the piece, but it, it doesn't appear so. It just appears like they're happening. Um, they're just happening on all the downbeats through this section, creating sort of a sense of propulsion and motion forward. All right, I gotta answer the question, what is the flute? The top upper flutes. Okay, well, all this stuff in here that's sustained pitches is definitely background material. As well as that arpeggiated figure because we've been labeling it like that so far to this point. So why would it change? I just don't know what the flutes are here, as well as this. I think that this here is background material. And I think that that, that uh, violin stuff is going to emerge as its own independent element, messing things up until the end of this section. I'm not going to label the rest of the section just because we can assume that once the composer sets up a certain orchestration for a passage, the composer will keep that orchestration for the passage. He's not going to alter things later on. All right, let's listen through to a part of this and uh, oh, my mouse is on the wrong screen. And, uh, and here, and I'm really gonna listen for this violin gesture and uh, the first violin, this idea here. And then I'm also really gonna listen for the flutes and see if I can hear exactly what's going on, how those things fit in. Okay, so that's the section just happened there. You can hear it with the antique symbol. I think that's a crotale, but uh, antique symbol is like a name that I'm not used to having associated with it. Okay, let's keep listening. Very interesting. I can actually hardly hear that violin stuff. It is just like becoming part of the texture. And the most noticeable element that I'm actually most surprised about is the antique symbol. It's really cutting through because it has a very sharp attack. I'm actually gonna label it with the color that I gave to the ostinato because it feels similar to the ostinato figure. It's this kind of alternation back for, back and forth. And I'm gonna label the violin, since a lot of the strings are participating in more like background textural stuff, I'm gonna label it also as, as yellow. It could also be the more teal color that I had here. So it could also be this, oops, sorry. It could also be this, where the upper strings are creating this more shimmering effect in the background. And then the bass and celli are creating the more arpeggiated effects. And then other people are contributing on top of that. I think when we look at this passage as a whole, Stravinsky has has set up basically three things. He's set up, number one, that the trum trumpets are playing the primary melodic material. Undoubtedly, the trumpets are playing the primary melodic material. Then, on top of that, we have this ostinato figure, which is continuing, and the accompaniment, which are continuing. So those are just, we've assumed that those are there, they're just still there. It's kind of the background texture. Foreground texture is, is trumpet. And then blurring the distinction between all of these things and just making everything sort of blend together, we have the upper strings and the upper winds, which are creating these energetic textures. So we have the sort of previous melodic material from the flutes, which is contributing to the texture. Then we have this new idea from the clarinets, which is contributing. And then these more active lines that are now also in the violins. It's worth noting that I still think, even despite all of this material that Stravinsky is throwing at this passage, that the intent of the passage is clear. This is a large 2T passage, and the trumpets are the most important thing. Also, all of the elements are, all of the prominent elements that provide this sense of chaos have been present previously, except one which is the violins adding more texture. So these uh, 16th note runs in the violins 
and this trill figure with the descending motion, that is really like the only thing that's really been added in in this section. And I guess the horn articulations on the beginning of each beat, but those really feel more like a rhythmic element rather than uh, like thematic in some way. It's like, yeah, okay, there's this real rhythmic element now that's been added to flesh out the texture a little bit more. So from that perspective, I'm, again, I'm trying to drive some sense of simplicity from these passages rather than looking at them and just going like, wow, there's a lot going on that's really complex. Like simply, what is he trying to get across? Huge tutti texture that has a very chaotic um, texture. It's a very chaotic tutti texture. And the primary melodic material is the trumpet. The tutti texture is built from elements that we've already had present in the music so that it doesn't feel foreign and out of place. All right, let's listen through just to the start of 30. I wanna hear 30 just, just before we start because I think I remember what this section is. Okay, so when you listen to this section, it gets really clear what's actually going on. This section is accompanimental. There's nothing here that feels largely thematic at this section of the piece. I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit, nice. So right here in 30, we don't have anything that feels largely accompanimental. Now, the biggest thing about this passage that really gets me about it is it has a ton of tension and it feels like it's really moving forward. So because of that, I wanna look into the pitch content and see, or pitch and rhythmic content and see what is giving this, sen this section the sense of tension. That's really the thing that I wanna deduce from this section. So not so much about layering, I'll talk a little bit about that, but, but tension mostly. I think one of the main things that's giving tension are these, off, these offset attacks, which are up here in the winds. And I'm gonna label those as the primary element. If you observe the rhythmic distribution of those elements, it is the same distribution as it was originally the case at the beginning of this dance. Offbeat, offbeat, breaks for a bar, then offbeat, then two downbeats, and then a final offbeat. That was the same thing that the horns did. Just this time, it's in uh, string pits and winds. So it's also in here. Uh, yep, all in here. He's using the... Uh, The violas, the violas to do those pitches and the violins at the beginning. It's almost like the first ones are more emphasized and then after that less emphasized. I also have one here. Okay, let's look at the pitch content. So we have All right. I get how Stravinsky is making this sound super tense. It's a bunch of parallel diminished fifths. So the first one that we have is B and F, and then we go to D and A flat. So that's a diminished seventh chord. So we're just walking through the diminished seventh chord, and then we go down a semitone. Oh, sorry. And we go through another diminished seventh chord, and then we return to the initial pitch. So. Here, if we look at this, this bar is the same and this bar is the same. And let's see if that checks out for all the other instruments. It does not. The other instruments are changing underneath, but that idea is repeating. It's based on diminished seventh chords. Let's see now what the violin twos are doing. Ah, they're arpeggiating a small portion of this diminished seventh chord, but now in triplets. So we have a polyrhythmic relationship. The top is playing uh, tremolo, no, not tremolo, 16th notes on the diminished fifths. And then the bottom part is arpeggiating through the triad in a polyrhythmic relationship, triplets in this case. Then we have uh, this, it says four soli. So four violas that are, that's like just wild. Some orchestras only have four violas. <laughs> Anyways, um, and is this in treble clef? Yeah, it is. Okay, so. Okay. 
Okay, it has this kind of like chromatic uh, neighbor tone motion. So you're starting on F and ending on F, but then he's neighboring with the G flat and the E. So there's this chromatic motion underneath. It's key to note that those pitches that he's neighboring around chromatically, those pitches are chord tones. So F is a chord tone of this diminished, oh sorry, this diminished seventh chord, which was the first diminished seventh chord. And then the next tone that he does that with is E, which is part of this diminished seventh chord. So that line is stepping down chromatically. The next note, oh sorry, first F, then E flat. Wait, am I right? Yeah, I am. That E flat is actually not in the chord then. So the second one is not a chord tone. First one is chord tone, second one is not chord tone. Then he goes to the E natural, which is also not a chord tone. So there's no relationship in terms of pitch with the violas and the violins at this point. Oh, great. The, uh, the cello is continuing the ostinato. <laughs> uh, not the solo cello, but the section of cellos. I'm gonna circle that in blue. Cute. It's really cute how he sets up a texture like this that has a ton of um, anxiety in it and then continues um, and continues the ostinato. It's also worth noting here that this basically is the continuation of that accompanimental figure that we've had before. So the the low strings essentially just keep doing what they're doing. And then the top strings add this, this uh, like, I'm gonna just gonna put it in like a little bit darker yellow because it's, it's also part of the accompaniment, but it's like this nervous part of the accompaniment. It's creating a ton of energy. I think he's created the energy in two ways. Dissonant chords that involve a lot of tritones and number two, polyrhythmic uh, stacking. Lower parts are faster, higher parts are slower or I guess slower in terms of uh, use of pitch, but really this is a four against three passage. because so we have triplets in the second violins, which are pits, and then everything else is four. And then he continues this same texture, but now he adds um, these articulations to the texture. So sets up the texture for two bars and then articulates the texture in a way that he's done before. Really neat. Uh, we could go through and break this all down, but uh, second violins are still doing the same kind of arpeggiation figure in pizzicatos, and first violins are continuing with these, these uh, 16th notes. Violas are also continuing in 16th notes. It is interesting that both first violins are going up and violas are going down. So he has this sense of contrary motion in both the parts, like they're, they're constantly reaching towards something. So let's look at that. Let's look at the structural pitches of this. So structural pitches tend to be the outside pitches like the most important pitches. So like, what's the lowest pitch here? Or what's the, the key pitch? Like if we have a neighbor tone, like clearly the F is the most important pitch there. We're just circling around the F. So we start on um, F, A flat, then A flat goes up to B flat. Then we have a repeat of that bar. Then, okay, so here we start to see, I'll just keep it this color. We start to see structural change here. The pattern is sequenced up, it moves up. Yep. And then it repeats and then it moves up here. Yeah. Each time this material is diminished, but he moves it up and then he moves it up again. So it's on one pitch level for three bars, then on one pitch level for two bars, then on another pitch level for three more bars. So this sense of sequencing the pitch content up is creating that sense of, I think, uh, tension, tension building. Let's listen to that little passage. I'll just start here. You can really hear the tension rise when that diminished seventh steps up. And then it'll do it again here. So you get that sense of constant rising of tension throughout this section. Again, I talked about in the last section about the composer's intent. And I think that that's something I'm trying to incorporate in my own work right now is a strong sense of intent. So when you listen to a passage of my music, you go, what's the composer's intent? 
this is supposed to be tense and it's intensifying like becoming more tense we're leading somewhere we're going somewhere there's motion sense of motion it's like have you ever watched a movie and then like there's a scene and they're like talking about things and you're like how does this relate i don't know where it's going so i'm trying to avoid that the musical equivalent of that creating motion and direction in my music okay this section starts now uh this section is really interesting so he's Taking that melody that he had before, that melody, and he's using it. So Piccolo has that melody, definitely primary material here. Interesting thing here is that we've got these, uh, the horn and the bassoon are doing this offbeat, really weird, like, it's like, ah, what's happening? It feels like so out of place in some ways. Now, I'm going to probably label the strings and the bassoons all doing that, and I'm going to give them secondary material. Because it seems like the strings just like kind of add in and comment on this gesture as it's happening. Uh, it's worth noting here that he has the violins and uh, the celli pitzing. There's a reason for that. So it makes sense to have second violins and violas because they're more like in the inside of the orchestra, just keep going with the accompaniment. But he also is using the celli as the pitzing instruments because they have a larger cavity of sound. I think it's going to project a lot better. It, it does interest me that he didn't put the double basses in on those pitzes, but maybe he doesn't want quite as much bass sound. So he wants like a loud, but, but not super bassy sound. Uh, and then I think that what are the, the violas and violins are playing this dyad? C and D, up, 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 up. Uh, up and down bow, and they're doing, oh, sorry, pizzicati, so dun, 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 opposite directions. And the, the oboes and the English horn, well, look at what the English horn is doing. It's doing a transposed version of the, uh, they're actually all doing a transposed, it's essentially, this is essentially all this uh, ostinato, which has been happening. I should have chosen a color for this ostinato and just given it that color the entire time. So you could argue if the ostinato is actually a complement or if it's primary material. I think here it's like kind of background material or maybe, maybe it makes sense for four colors on this page. So you have this as definite accompaniment material. Then you have the ostinato, which I should have put in purple from the beginning. So ostinato, which is kind of altered in this case with the oboes and uh, English horn, but he's keeping it in similar instruments. So the tone color is very similar. So we're gonna hear those elements as related because of the tone color. Again, using orchestration to make musical ideas cohesive. We wanna hear the piccolo all by itself. There's no other flutes playing, just the piccolo is playing it solo. Then we wanna hear this little ostinato figure in the English horn and the winds. Well, yeah, we can hear it, but it's all oboes and English horns, all double reeds. We wanna hear this um, kind of offbeat thing. It's in horns and bassoons, which by the way, blend very well together. He actually uses the strings as the thing to switch between the horn and the bassoon. So the horn plays the first few and then the strings pits. And when the strings pits, the bassoon takes the line. So then when the strings go away, it's like bassoon or you're just like, oh cool, when did that change? Cause he's hidden it. It's a magic trick. Look over here. And then you look over here and then over here he does something. He changes the orchestration in some way. I learned this in, your, in my bachelor's degree, studying with Chris Paul Harmon. He was like, you wanna change like an orchestral texture? Say like, this is the chord that you have orchestrated. And you wanna bring this chord down to this chord. Well, just do like a large orchestral hit and then whoop, smaller chord right after the orchestral hit. So on the moment that the hit happens, change the orchestration. Then your listener is not going, oh, I really hear the sense that there's a full chord and then it shrinks. Instead, just hit something or play a loud instrument. Like it could be like a low, low trombone thing or a tam-tam hit or the whole orchestra could articulate or someone could play a little flourish in the winds, something like that. And then at that moment, at the arrival moment, change the orchestration. So Stravinsky is doing that here with the pizzas and the strings. Then we have uh, a little bit of remainder. Again, this material continues onto the next uh, the next system, and it is all identical. Again, nothing has been changed orchestrationally in this small section of music. He sets something up and then he leaves it. But then at the next section, he changes the orchestration dramatically. So this is how he's refreshing the ear constantly. I don't know if we've ever hit a rehearsal mark in this piece where the orchestration didn't change. 
let that sink in. I don't think we've ever hit a rehearsal mark in this piece where the orchestration didn't change. I also don't think a rehearsal mark was ever more than eight bars away from the previous one. Okay, 32, we clearly have this idea. Uh, that's clearly the da -dee -da, -da, -dee da dee da 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 And it's also still in flutes. So he's kind of married those ideas together. It's like the flute is doing this idea and, and it's always, it's gonna be mostly a flute idea. It only happens in the horn once. Again, I talked about the horn. Maybe the horn brings attention to that idea and get, let, lets it become solidified in our mind faster than if the flute had just played it initially. Okay, We've got a lot going on on this page. Uh, let's listen to the last section first and get through that and then we'll move on to the next section. So. The, the switch from horn to bassoon is actually very smooth because of those pitzes. Then the switch back though here, right here, back to horn is noticeable because he marks it sforzando and there isn't a pitz. So he allows us to hear that switch then back from bassoons, back to horn. And I think he's trying to emphasize the fact that the melody is starting up again as well. So it's like, there's this sense of a four bar phrase. You have the first four bars and then the horn articulates and the piccolo comes back in and we hear, oh, this is the second four bar phrase in this section which it is. And then the second four bars are orchestrated and uh, played out the exact same way as the first ones were. I guess it's contrabassoon he's moving to. Yeah, he's moving to contrabassoon. Okay, next section. Okay. This one is starting to look a little bit easier. Yes. Also, by the way, there's staccatissimo markings here, which are these little like wedges that point downwards on the winds. Funny story, I was uh, rebinding all the hotkeys in Dorco. I, I say hotkeys because I used to be a video gamer. <laughs> but uh, I was rebinding all my shortcuts, keyboard shortcuts in Dorco. And when I was doing that, I was there's they have staccatissimo markings. And I was like, what is that used for? I've literally never seen that. As a harpist, I've never seen a staccatissimo marking in my, in my score. And so I was just like, I don't even know if this exists. So I don't think I even bound it to something on my keyboard. Because I'm, I'm never going to write that. Here they are. In the, in the Stravinsky score. So I want to listen for that, for maybe a sharpness of attack, especially in the in the um, the double woodwinds. So the oboe and the English horn. And Stravinsky has also, I think he's trying to bring out this quality of really like jagged because he's got that with the violins. Da -da, da -da -da -da, da -da 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 I like this rhythm. This is like a metal rhythm. Yeah, good. <laughs> Yes, gonna steal this from Stravinsky. It's also, uh, it's on similar pitches. So in this case, half diminished seventh chord. Yeah, nice and dissonant, crunchy, I love it. Okay, so that's definitely one element. I think it's probably gonna be like background rhythmic element. We have a continuation of this offbeat element actually. And uh, unfortunately he just like adds the bassoon in on one, on two notes. Lovely, great for my analysis really just breaking everything that I've said. Set up instruments, let them stay in for the entire passage and play a line. Then Stravinsky just goes, ha ha ha, puts in this bassoon right here. Yikes. Okay, so uh, we got, I don't know what the main melodic material is. It's probably that. Okay, it's really obvious what the melodic material is in the next section. That's clearly the main melodic material. But these bars, I think these four bars are supposed to sound transitionary. So if I had to say what the phrasal goal is here, I would say this is a transition. I'm rolling all over the place here. So transition here. I think that that's definitely a transition. We're moving from something. Um, I think that the section before here, this is uh, tension. So it's building to something, builds, tension builds. Then we have uh, here, this is a statement. It's kind of like a disjunct statement almost. And then we have a sense of transition. This material is moving us to something else because there, there's these motions up in the bottom and like there's nothing that feels particularly thematic 
I want to listen to it first. Let's see what my ears say. Ears are often better than looking at the score. This is why when you're doing music theory homework, always do it at the piano. Always play every example. When you're reading a textbook, sit at the piano and play every chord that's written and every example that's in the textbook. If you did not read any of the prose and instead played every single example, I bet you would get a better education than you would if you just read all the prose and played no examples. Obviously the best education is play every example, read all the text, read six different textbooks, compare all the results, determine what you think the theorists are on about, and then decide, is any of this actually relevant to composing music? I think some of it is, I think some of it isn't. Okay, here we go. Okay, let's to start here. Okay. From like one second or half a second, I actually hear, I'm hearing like, like, Okay, I'm hearing the winds. I'm hearing piccolo clarinet and the clarinets. I'm hearing winds as primary. Yeah, this is really transitionary. It's holding time, right? It doesn't feel like, it actually doesn't feel like we're really going anywhere. It's like a, it's like a, it's rhythmically charged, but it doesn't feel like it's moving. He's just layered a bunch of stuff that doesn't move. It's all static. If you look at all the parts, they don't move. They just repeat the same stuff over and over again. If you repeat the same stuff over and over again, it will sound like your music is not doing anything. So this is a, tr let's just, I'm not gonna call it transition. Let's just call it a pause. It's an energetic pause. Uh, we can go through and pull it apart, but really I think what he's doing is he's got these two chords. Uh, he's got this uh, half diminished seventh chord. And then going to a dominant seventh chord. And he's just going back and forth between those two chords and then adding some like, really, if I had to break this down, I'm gonna do this. This is my analysis, my super specific. Nope, this is all the same. This is all the same. There's a secondary element here. There's some kind of baseline or something down here. Oh, 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 oh. My pen is not writing anymore. Great. No. Oh, it's because I'm in highlight mode. No highlight mode on scores. <laughs> not allowed. <laughs> okay, so we arrive here. Uh, it's clear now that the this kind of same textural idea that he's set up at the next section continues. But in this case, he wants the flutes and the piccolos to come through as primary material. Very clearly. They're up high. So... One thing with flutes, if you want your flutes to be heard in your orchestra, the flutes should always be in ledger lines. I, I learned this the hard way because my second flute part was always inside the staff and then you just never hear the second flute part. So put your second flute or put your flutes above the staff. In this case, if you don't want your flutes to be heard, just don't give them music to play. This sounds like full orchestral tutti, but Stravinsky doesn't write anything for the first flute. It's fine to just have people not play. That's totally fine. If they're not gonna be heard, don't make them play. They'll they'll care about the parts that they play. Okay, flutes, primary material. It's clear here that Stravinsky has this flutter tongue. It's in the staff, but that's also the alto flute. He probably doesn't care that it's heard. It's just supposed to be like kind of textural stuff that's in there that doesn't need to like jump to the forefront and go, aha. Also, here there's the oboe going, pa 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 Also, staccatissimo, so, I should use my staccatissimo markings because it's clearly achieving the kind of effect that I want to get when I'm trying to simulate these kind of metal rhythms within orchestra. So, staccatissimo, da 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 da, da, da in uh, in the oboes. We've got this. This bass line is continuing throughout. I'm going to mark this in yellow now. It's this offset bass line. It's really playing up this syncopated nature of the music. We then have. This, all this other stuff seems very textural. Like it's just holding space. Obviously we, we still have the uh, the lovely ostinato, which is still in the, now it's back in the English horn. Look at that, it found its way, found its way back into the English horn. I think everything else is just texture. Cause we have all the clarinets here that are da 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 da. 
and the horns do da da da, and then everything else is building and strings. I think we're gonna hear most prominently here. I think we're gonna hear flutes, and then yeah, I think we're gonna hear flutes. Probably the brass stuff that's going on. Let's listen. Oh, interesting. Da, ba, 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 ba. That actually comes through like crazy when it's in the trumpets. So it's it's kind of one of these interjection ideas. Right here, trumpets come through like wild. And it makes sense when the interjection pops in, we don't go like, why is that there? We understand it because we've, we've been hearing this rhythm this entire time in the clarinets, which is more subdued underneath this entire texture. It is interesting to some extent to see how Stravinsky has set up this texture. Uh, I think that that's probably the most interesting thing to discuss in this section. I gotta zoom in here. Okay, let's look. Oboes are playing this rhythm. Da da. That's the first two 16th notes. Clarinets are playing the first 16th note and the last 16th note. So the middle of the bar is absent currently. The brass is filling in the middle of the bar so that every 16th note is played on. And then the strings down here with, again, their stacchettissimo articulations are doing, excuse me, all four of the 16th notes. So this way we have full rhythmic saturation. None of the 16th notes are going unarticulated. So we get this constant sense of rhythm just pounding away, but everyone is interacting with that underlying pulse in a very interesting way. No one is just playing the same rhythm. No, not everyone's just because then it would sound just like every, like, like, like mush kind of, but he's created this very supple texture that is it feels like it breathes, it has air, and that it kind of moves and has a groove to it. Even though the groove is actually just da 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 He's creating groove by layering these things. I just want to quickly look at uh, registration for this texture. So how did he put it together in a way that we hear this as a block of sound? And how does he orchestrate the instruments within that sound? So at the top, I think we're going to have oboes and clarinets. Oboes and clarinets are playing the same pitch material. So they're playing this diminished seventh chord. Oboes and clarinets, same pitch material, different rhythms. Horns are an octave lower than that. And the trumpet is occupying the same space. So all of this stuff is all fit within the same two octave register, this register. I'm playing this chord wrong. That's the chord. Everyone is fit within that register, and the flutes are above that register the entire time. The only note that the flute plays that is in that register is the G, which is the top note that the oboe plays. So they're never competing for register. The melodic element is always above the, this accompanimental textural element. Stravinsky is doing something here, which is the English horn is just completely covered by the horns. You're probably not going to hear it at all just because it's covered. But that ostinato figure has been in the piece the entire time. And I don't think that we really like, it's more like cool to notice it when you go through the score and you're like, oh, neat that it's there. That he just has this like through line through the entire thing. But I don't think it's like musically relevant for it to like cut through to the forefront all the time. It's really boring. Bum, 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 bum. It just keeps going. The strings are in the same register. So on the, the same pitches that the oboe starts on. They're just doing neighboring motion there to create a more harmonic blur. And then underneath this texture is the bass line. Honestly, Stravinsky could have written this with two hands. Bass line playing the offset things and then right hand playing the flute melody. That's it, there's two things, bass line, melody. Then he's used everyone else in the orchestra here, which looks incredibly complicated. Like there's a lot going on. He's used everyone else just to create an interesting texture. So flutes up in ideal range with piccolos an octave higher. So it's really gonna cut through. Everyone else in the middle register playing accompanimental stuff that rhythmically interlocks in a very interesting way. Down at the bottom, 
celli, bass, and both and bassoon and contrabassoon playing the bass line. It's key to note one thing orchestrationally here, which is his use of the contrabassoon. Look at how he only puts it in on key low pitches. That was the same low two pitches, this F. It's technically an octave lower, but that low F to G was the same low F to G that he originally scored the bassoon on. I was like, why did he do that? He just put this random thing in. He clearly wants to emphasize those moments where it hits those notes. He comes back to it here. Those notes, da -dum, da -dum, emphasizing that. Interesting. Okay, listen. I think I gotta go back a tiny bit. Okay, that's the section. You you just hear this like pulsating rhythmic texture, which feels like like it's hard to latch onto and know what the actual rhythm is. Like I'm hearing like da 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 like that that uh the oboe and clarinet compound rhythm da 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 da, which was the rhythm that the violins had previously. But then the violins blur that by playing every single note, and the horns fit in in the gap. Whoops. Moving on. Oh, yes, yes, more wind insanity. I love the wind insanity. Uh, these sections that have these crazy winds where it's just going all over the place. I'm like, yes, it looks so compl complicated, but it's usually really not. So let's dig apart what's actually happening. Yeah, I think that he just is continuing similar textural st stuff that he was doing before, but so obviously the oboes are continuing to do what they were doing, which is this background texture. Obviously the bassoons and the contrabass and the celli are also continuing to provide this uh, offset bass line. These, uh, these all offbeat lines are something that Stravinsky clearly likes to do. He does that in the Firebird, the infernal dance. Dun, 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 dun. That sounds like it's three, four. Bum, 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 bum. But it's actually all offbeats. Dun, 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 dun. It's like really hard to play because of that. Okay, so probably we're gonna we're gonna keep hearing flutes as primary material here, because flute and piccolo at this register are they're in their this is like their low projecting register. They can project there, but they're not really high. The highest note they get to here, which is that high G right here, that's a screamer. Those notes are starting that like the F, the G, and then above that. Those notes are like, they're gonna cut through no matter what you do. It's hard for flute players to make those notes quiet. They can, they train to do that, but it's hard. So because of that, as the flute goes up, it's just gonna start projecting more and more and more. He's actually, the first flute is in like the least ideal register. So that proves to me that these chromatic lines that he has going, both in the uh, flute one and the alto flute, are really just texture. It's in the background, it's stuff that's just supposed to create the sense of like interesting flutter tongue motion, but it's not supposed to jump through into the foreground. That's like a background gestural stuff. He also has it in the clarinet and the piccolo clarinet, also in unideal registers. We're gonna hear it at one moment, which is when the B flat clarinet comes in and plays the two ledger lines above. I bet we're gonna hear that flutter tongue descent down. And he actually adds in more clarinets, two more clarinets, as that gesture progresses. Look at that. Right here, starts with high clarinet. And as he goes down and gets into the weaker registers, at a rhythmically important moment, inserts in two more clarinets or yep, two more clarinets, the bass clarinet and the other B flat clarinet to really add emphasis. Now he adds them in, but he does not add them in um, on the same pitch. It's not a doubling. He instead adds them in the, the first clarinet, which is actually uh, playing the lower line here. It, it comes in a third underneath that first clarinet that's coming down. So it creates a sense of harmonic filling out without the implication of if these guys have to play the exact same line at the exact same time, flutter tongue, with this crazy like crazy rhythm, septuplet against um, eight. So grouping of eight, no, both grouping of, no, grouping of six against grouping of seven. If they have to play this crazy polyrhythm 
and they have similar pitches, it's just going to sound like a giant mush. So let's get them on different, slightly different pitch levels so that it obviously is going to sound like mush instead of just sounding like out of tune, people can't play together, you're bad musicians, you're fired. Don't do that to your poor clarinet players. So don't add it in on the same pitch emphasis and then like just make it be all sloppy. Even if they had the exact same rhythm and they had to go down chromatically like that, flutter tongue very fast, it's probably best to not get them doing the same thing. Unless there's like 20 of them. Like if every single wind in this piece is doing the same descending line, Shostakovich does this in his symphonies. He'll have these giant wind gestures that move up. And when those wind gestures move up, they're all unison. But it's like, it's like nine winds all at the same time. So there's a huge chorus effect and we get that blurring that we would want. Whereas if you have two guys playing the same line, just going to be sloppy. Okay, so he clearly uses the first clarinet as a secondary player in this gesture because he's resting the first clarinet after the initial gesture, which was first clarinet, piccolo clarinet. So he prioritized the first clarinet in that way. And then gives that first clarinet player a little bit of a break to make sure that they're in the right place, adds them in as secondary material underneath the third clarinet or fourth clarinet. It's too many clarinets. It's too many wins, wins by five. It's just, it's hard to talk about, I'm sorry. This is the only piece I've ever analyzed that has wins by five, by the way. If we look here, every single beat has, it doesn't appear that way when I looked at the score, I was like, oh, there's some gaps. There are no gaps. First, first bar, flute. Second bar, clarinet. Third bar, clarinet and flute. Fourth bar, clarinets. So there is always a flutter tongue chromatic gesture during this passage. Always. Horns and trumpets and trombones are all doing the same thing that they were doing. This kind of background texture. It actually makes sense. He's taken his winds out to do other things, these gestural things with the winds. And instead he's reinforced the texture with the brass. So previous texture didn't have nearly as much brass in it. Just horns, a little bit of trombone action. Trumpets at important moments to introduce their sound color. And then adds those people in here to strengthen that texture while pulling away winds to do something else. Great orchestration trick. You want to fill out the texture, save people from the previous texture, make it very full. And then you want these guys' roles, their, their role to change the, the winds. Add in more trumpets or whatever on that previous music. And then have these people switch away to do something else. Nice. Stravinsky, you're a genius. We all knew that already, though. Okay. Uh, I guess that's the baseline. All this other stuff is, is background material, I'm pretty sure. Let's see if we can hear this violin playing these harmonics. No. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> I, I hear like a, like the, you hear high stuff, but you don't hear the violins. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. I gotta say, okay, we're almost there. Oh, I have eight minutes to get through this. I don't know if I can do it. I think there's two rehearsal marks. There's two rehearsal marks. It's going to be hard. Okay. First one is four bars long. Uh, winds are clearly doing this. Uh, chromatic stuff. Uh, really key to note here. Look at the flute. Flute has really fast rhythms. Sextuplets. Oboe has eighth notes or sixteenth notes. Flute is much more agile and nimble. Flute gets more material. Oboe gets less material. Oboe goes less high. Flute goes higher. Um, very clearly, flutes and clarinets and oboes, or and the top oboe, are all contributing to these flourishes in the background. So you can see. Last time it was like one person at a time. Now it's a bunch playing all at once. There is about, there are, yeah, there are usually four players, four to five players on each flourish at each moment. Here we go, all of this. I think I circled some notes at the end. Oh, just the first one. So this first, yeah, it dies out. It dies out by the third bar. The fourth bar doesn't actually have any of those. Take this out. It's only here. He switches the role of this clarinet at the end to play this little like concluding gesture, almost like the winds come together at that moment. 
You have the texture is is massively um, enhanced with everyone else. The trumpets are now playing that rhythm, da 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 da, that they had before, and then the oboes are still taking the da 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 da. My favorite rhythm. <laughs> um, and then the strings are also doing a, a bunch of um, material. The I think the low strings, so the lower portion of the strings are playing. Oh my gosh. What are the basses doing? Guys, guys and girls, what are the basses doing? This is wild bass writing. Uh, this is the same bass line that we've had this whole time that has been rhythmically offset, but now he just went crazy with it. Aha! <laughs> now you have to jump octaves and, and uh, still do all this stuff. So yeah, cool. Cool Stravinsky, gonna make it sound wild down there. That's still the baseline. So we got baseline continuing. I see what he's doing here. Okay, baseline, this is tons of energy. He's trying to create energy. Primary material, violins, in octaves. When first violins are in octaves, you hear it. Or first and second violins, you hear it. This is, uh, probably a giant uh, giant orchestra. So he can afford to have some violins up doing these really high harmonics and other violins playing textural stuff. If you were writing this for like a contemporary orchestra these days, I would say pretty much exclusively you should have all the violins playing that material at this point while everyone else is creating the texture behind. Then uh, flutes, pick, sorry, piccolo is playing primary material, so creating a lightness to the sound of the violins, an airiness to the sound, and then everyone else is doing background stuff. I guess bassoons are also doing uh, bass line. Their bass line has now got trills on it. <laughs> awesome. All right, puts the bass clarinet, bass clarinet in only on those important notes, remember? Important notes, bass clarinet comes in just for the important notes, emphasizing something, making it so that the texture, the entire texture of the passage is not all the same texture. The texture kind of like, it ebbs and flows. It gets more intense, it gets less intense. It gets more intense, it gets less intense. Adding someone in at key moments to intensify the texture, then removing them to de-intensify the texture, to give that sense of breath. So it doesn't just feel like everyone has music all the time and it's just this huge wash of sound that our ear gets tired of. It feels like it moves, it goes somewhere. Okay, uh, then we have these two chords. Mm, ba, ba. Those chords are obviously references to these offbeat chords that we've had this entire time. Here, we can probably just continue because I think that this, yep, exact same orchestration, four more bars of the same orchestration, ba, ba, at the end of the four bars, so clear phrase length here, we have four bars, it's this melody we've been hearing this entire second section of this piece, da -de -da -da -de -da 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 -da. and then we have 36. Okay, so something changes here in 36, and we move from these woodwind figures that are going up and down, kind of triangle pyramid shapes, to woodwind fingers now that are going exclusively up. I think that what that's gonna do is give a much more driving sense that this music is moving up. We also have the horns doing glisses, which is gonna create a ton of momentum. And then these chords at the end, that's really the only things that have changed. He changes here the these gestures in the background to make them go up. He's also emphasizing them more a little bit by adding more players in on them. These ones are always five players, plus the horn doing the gliss, so six players, and the horn doing the gliss is gonna be very loud. And that's it. Ba, ba, stops. And this is the section where you get that like, ba, 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 ba. This thing is, uh, this thing is wild. Yeah, yeah. Okay, ritual of abduction. Ritual of, of abduction we're gonna do next time. I'm super excited. I guess we got to page 32. It's actually making progress this time. Feels good. Feels good getting through that whole first two, what are the first two large sections of the piece, the introduction and then this dance. So um, there is one thing. There is one stone that I have not turned over yet that I want to turn over. So, uh, This idea feels related to the other idea. Ba -dee -da -da -dee -da. Uh. 
Yeah, these feel related. I want to I want to spend a tiny bit of time the last two minutes, just quickly looking for some motivic connections between those two. It's always nice to know, did the composer take something and then base something else around it so that they feel like they're connected? These two ideas do come from different movements or different sections. So um, the first one's the a kiss of a kiss of the earth, and it's the introduction. The introduction features this line, and then the second part features the. It's similar. In, in overall contour, the first one is a little bit wider. It goes to a minor seventh at the outside from E to D. It's in C. This second gesture starts in F and it has a fifth contour. Very, very um, similar contour. Now, the first idea here that we're seeing is very, very, very free. The rhythmic placement of it is very free, but the one internal feature that it has that alludes to this other gesture is these these uh, little grace notes. That da 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 that turn alludes to da 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 da. So in that way, just by utilizing grace notes, he's created a sort of continuity between these two ideas. I do think that they're fundamentally different ideas, but there is a sense of continuity. The one has more seconds and fourths in it. This one has more thirds. So anyways, I uh, hope that this journey through the Rite of Spring is in intriguing and engaging. I hope you're learning a lot. If you have any questions about it, throw them in the comments below. I'm happy to answer questions about this piece as well as my thinking process about the piece because I'm sure I'm missing a lot of things that other people think are really important. So if there's something you think is like, this should be the focus of the analysis, like pitch content uh, of a certain instrument line or something like that, then let's look at that. And so put it in the comments, then I'll know to focus my analysis on some of those aspects in previous movements. But I do want to get through this without spending a full eight hour, like full 40 hour work week going through this piece. Anyways, thanks for watching. See you next time.